Amen. Thank you for that. If you have your Bibles this evening, I invite you to take them. And let's go to the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter number 7, please. The Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter number 7, is where we'll find our text this evening. And if you're not familiar with the uh, minor prophets and kind of the location of those books, uh, Zechariah is really easy to find. Go to the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and then just go back one book, and you'll come to the book of Zechariah, and you'll find uh, chapter number 7 there. It is the second to last book in, our, uh, in the order, at least, in which we find them uh, in our Old Testament. So Zechariah chapter number 7 is where uh, we'll find our text for the message tonight. And we're really going to preach through this whole chapter, but I want us to look at, uh, focus in on verse number 13 as kind of our text. And this is where we'll find uh, kind of the title, or at least the idea, the reason uh, is what we'll look for as the title here. Look in verse number 13, if you would, of Zechariah chapter number 7. The Bible says this, Therefore it has come to pass, that as he cried, now the he there is speaking of the prophet, the prophets, the preachers that God would send uh, the way of the uh, Old Testament and the Jews, as he cried, the Bible says, and they would not hear. So God said, as, God, as God's man has cried over the years, and you have refused to hear, you've shut your ears, notice at the end of this, that as he cried and they w would not hear, so they cried, speaking of the people. So now the tables have been turned. Now they're in trouble. They're having problems. They're having issues. The Bible says, and as so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. I want to preach to you this evening a message that I've simply entitled Silent Treatment. The Silent Treatment. Has anybody ever played a game like that on you before? Um, silent treatment has been used, I suppose, down through the years of, uh, of history to uh, exact some form of payback or penalty or revenge when someone perhaps has crossed you in a way that you did not appreciate. In other words, you uh, are offended in some way, and so your stance is just, well, fine. If that's the way it's going to be, I'm just not going to talk to them. I'm not going to listen to them. I'm not going to be involved in a relationship with them. I am done. I think we find the silent treatment probably, I think we find it played out most often in perhaps the home. I, I think of it on, on perhaps two different levels. And the first form of silent treatment uh, that I think of is probably not the most common, uh, at least it ought not to be the most common, and that is, uh, that is the silent treatment that sometimes children give to their parents. I don't know what it is about um, these modern devices that, um, that we have in our society, in our culture, things like iPhones and iPads and Kindles and whatever, whatever device or tablet you might have. But when, uh, when my, my children have them in their hands, it automatically turns them to be deaf. <laughs> Literally, if my child has a, a tablet or a little phone and, and he or she is holding it in their hands, I can, I can stand, I could shout, I can jump up and down, I could do jumping jacks, I could make faces, I could scream, I can shout, I can holler, and chances are I'm going to be completely ignored. That bothers me greatly, it bothers me a great deal. Sometimes my child will be on one of those devices and I'll say, hey, your room needs to be cleaned up, go clean up your room. And I'll carry on with whatever it is that I'm involved in and I'll go back by the room five, seven, eight, ten minutes later and the room has not been touched. The light is not on, and if I'll make my way back to where I first found my child, chances are they're still staring into that particular device. They didn't hear a word I said. Uh, that is a great frustration and something certainly that we as parents ought to be working on uh, in the home and in the lives of our, uh, of our children. It doesn't have to be a device. It can be anything fun that they're doing, or perhaps maybe you've asked them to do something that they don't want to do, and so they pretend as if they didn't hear you. So that's one form of the silent treatment. The other form, I think, is probably the most common. And that's when a spouse crosses their spouse. They, maybe, maybe they did it intentionally. Maybe they did it unintentionally. Maybe they were just insensitive about a particular thing. And uh, maybe it's a specific or a particular pet peeve that their wife has or that their husband has. And so as a result of that, well, if that's the way it's going to be, fine. I'm just not going to talk to you. 
And we could be sitting in the same vehicle. We could be driving down the road. Uh, We could be uh, lying in the same bed together. We could be sitting at the same table together. Uh, We we could say this or we can talk. We can try to communicate. And that person has basically just determined, no, I'm not talking. I I am using the silent treatment. I've often wondered, you know, whoever came up with that? I mean, what in the world, what kind of, what kind of problem-solving solution is that? You know, I, I'm, I'm mad at you because you've hurt me, you've offended me, therefore, I'm just not, we're just not going to talk about it. Well, that's not going to solve anything anytime soon. You're just going to make things worse. And so, and so oftentimes we see these things played out in our society and in our culture, and yet as I come to Zechariah chapter 7 and verse number 13, it sounds as if God is essentially going to employ the silent treatment on his people. Well, that's a fascinating thought, isn't it? There obviously are two forms of silent treatment. The first form could be, I'm not going to talk to you. You can say anything that you want to, and I'm just not going to talk to you. And we certainly find that in the intertestamental period, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we know there were at least 400 years of silence from God. He wasn't talking. He wasn't communicating. He was not speaking. The people perhaps wanted to hear from him, but his lips were closed and they were shut. His voice was silent. In this particular instance here, in Zechariah 7 and verse number 13, this form of the silent treatment is not, I'm not going to talk to you. This form of the silent treatment is this, I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to listen to you. You can cry all you want. You can make all the noise that you want, but I'm not going to listen. When we, were, when we were parents, young parents, I should say, when our children were just infants, there was always that struggle of knowing when do we intervene. I suppose maybe we still, we still have to deal with that as, as parents. Our children are a little bit older now. But, but I can remember, I can remember the, the baby had been, she had been fed, she had been bathed, she had been changed, She had been swaddled, and she was in the most comfortable crib that we could possibly provide for her, and yet she was still crying. And we would, we would lay in bed, and my wife would, would, would roll over to, 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 to get out, because Lord knows I wasn't going to do it. And, and, uh, and she, would, she would begin to move, and I would say, wait, wait, she's fine. I mean, we've, we've given her everything that she could possibly desire. She's fine. Let her cry it out. There were, there were times in which we let them cry it out only to find out later there was a problem, there was an issue, and we always felt horrible at that. And there was just that constant struggle as parents to know, what do we do here? Well, God told his, God told his people, he said, look, you, you can cry all you want. You can make all the noise that you want. You can be as loud as you possibly desire, but I will not Hear you now. Please understand that God was not being uh, God was not being a jerk. God was not being rude. In fact, if you study the uh, the, the pages of Scripture, you'll find uh, that God had had given had given centuries of patience and long suffering to His people. He had he had he had labored with them over and over and over again. So when we finally get to this tactic, it's almost like God says, okay, now I'm going to go nuclear because I have given you chance after chance after chance after chance. And we could go on and on and on tonight with this thought or this idea. And God finally says, enough. I will not hear when you cry. I want to give a little bit of background here to this passage, because probably if you're like most Christians, you're like most church members, you probably don't know a whole lot about this character by the name of Zechariah, and you don't really know a whole lot about what was going on in the nation of Israel's history. Uh, maybe you've read this book before, but perhaps maybe uh, you're, you're not totally clued in on exactly what's going on here. And I would say probably the average Christian would be in that, in that way. And so let me just give you a little bit of background on Zechariah and who he was. He was a prophet, of course. And, um, and he was among the remnant of 
Jews that had returned to Judah after the 70-year captivity. God had prophesied this. He had said, Babylon's going to come. They're going to take you into exile, and it's going to last 70 years because you have refused to listen. You refused to hearken. This is the only way that I can get your attention is by destroying your home, uh, removing you from your land, causing you to have to go into another society and another culture, and, uh, and that's the only way that I can get your attention. I have to, I, I have to get very, very serious here. And so, um, and so at the end of the 70 years, uh, provision had been made. Um, the, the governments had said, okay, now you can go back to your homes. God essentially was inviting them back. Come on back to Judah. Reestablish things. The, the, the punishment is over. It's time now to get back to where you need to be. Well, unfortunately, just a small remnant of people returned at the end of that 70 years. This is during the time in which uh, Nehemiah comes back and they're rebuilding the wall. And, and of course, Ezra, he comes back and he's overseeing and helping with the rebuilding of the temple. And so uh, Zechariah is a contemporary with all of these people. He's a contemporary prophet with Haggai. Remember Haggai chapter number one, where the Bible says, how long are you going to dwell in your sealed houses and my house lies waste? And essentially the theme of Haggai is to rise and build. And so, and so Zechariah is, is living and he's prophesying. He's ministering during this particular time. So, so we have just a small remnant of people that come back at the invitation of God back into the land where God wants them to be. This is the promised land. He's saying, come on back home. But very few of them return. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Well, during the, during the captivity, the Jews had been scattered really all over the world in many respects. And many of them, listen, many of them had been in captivity so long, they no longer viewed their exile negatively. In other words, they had, they had just gotten comfortable where they were. You have to understand, a generation, maybe even two generations, had never been to the promised land. They had only heard about Zion, Jerusalem, the temple, and all of the things, the land flowing with milk and honey. They had never experienced it. They had never seen it with their own eyes. And so as a result of that, when it came time for the doors to be thrown open again, come on back home, many of them sat back and said, why would we want to go back there? We're pretty comfortable here. Our kids like the schools. We've got a good job. We're prosperous. We're making money. They had grown quite comfortable where they, where they were, and they had found that the places they were were economically prosperous for them. A lot of money. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, a great example of this is, is the book of Esther. Uh, we won't take time to turn there and look there, but if you want to perhaps write down this scripture as, a, as just a reference, you can write down Esther chapter 3 and verse number 9. Haman is the evil character in the book of Esther, and, and, and we know Haman's plot is to destroy the Jews. Essentially, he wanted to perform a holocaust long before, long before the name of Hitler was ever, would ever cross anybody's lips. And he even, got, he even got permission from the king during that time, King Ahasuerus, to, uh, to, to produce this, uh, this, this holocaust. In his in his pursuit of this, he says to King Ahasuerus, he says this, he says, look, if you'll give me permission to do this, by slaughtering all of the Jews in your kingdom, we will add 10,000 talents of silver to your treasury. Now that sounds like a lot, but we, we, we sit here and say, well, 10,000 talents is, I don't know, is it $10,000? What is that? And, and in my study, my understanding is, is that 10,000 talents of silver at this day and age was an enormous amount. It would, some would estimate it to be two-thirds of the annual revenue of the empire. So in other words, he's saying by, by slaughtering all these Jews, everything that they, that they have becomes ours. We, they, they, they are, they, they're our prisoners. We, we kill them and we keep their money. We, we, we keep their houses. We keep their lands. Uh, we keep all of these things. We sell off whatever we need to sell off. And king, he, you're going to be that much more wealthy. So these Jews that were living in all of these other parts of the world, they had become quite prosperous. They had become quite successful. And so as a result of that, when the invitation comes, come on back home, they said, nah, no thanks. Thanks. 
Because in contrast, when we, when we see the scene in Judah during this time, what do we find? We find the Jews there are, are in great poverty. Uh, in contrast, they're not wealthy. They're, uh, many of them are poor. Many of them are weak. Many of them are discouraged. And so those who are sitting afar off, they're looking at their homeland, just kind of watching to see how things go. We're going to let this first group of remnants, we're going to let them kind of be the guinea pigs, so to speak. And we're going to watch how they fare, and we're going to make a decision, a determination, whether we ever go back home based on how things are going there. And things weren't going well there at all. In the midst of all of this, we come to Zechariah 7. We find that there's a collection of exiled Jews that come back to Jerusalem during this time. And, and we find and we learn of this in the very beginning of this chapter. The Bible says it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Shislu, when they had sent unto the house of God Sherezer and Regamelech and their men to pray before the Lord. So these two men, I'm given to understand, were, were those that were living in Babylon. And they had sent them. They said, you go home, and we we want you to take care of some business. You're coming back, but here's what we want you to do. We want you to go back to Jerusalem, and we want you, first of all, to pray before the Lord. That was the first purpose of their trip. The Bible doesn't really necessarily tell us exactly what their prayer was, but but, but we're told that they came to pray before the Lord. There was a second purpose to this mission or this journey, and we learn of that in chapter 7 in verse number 3. And let's, let's consider it very quickly. The Bible says this, and to speak unto the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets saying. So first purpose, go back to Jerusalem to pray before the Lord. Second purpose, talk to the priests and ask them this question. Well, what is the question? We'll look at the end of verse number three. Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many times? years. You know, there's a good chance that probably if you were ever reading this passage of scripture, that question wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to you. What is he talking about? Should I, should I weep in the fifth month as I've done all these years? What, what is he talking about? What does he mean here? Well, let me try to explain it just a little bit because this question is going to, this is going to kind of form the basis for the message that we're going to, we're going to share with you tonight. Since the downfall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., the Jews had observed four annual fasts to commemorate some of their more recent tragic events. Let me me share them with you very quickly. They began with the siege of Jerusalem in the ninth year and tenth month of Zedekiah's reign. You can learn about this in 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse number 1 or Jeremiah chapter 52 and verse number 4. Things were happening, Every, you know, they were enjoying life, they were disobedient to God, but they were enjoying their life, they were living in their homeland, and remember God said, hey, I'm going to send a foreign enemy in, he's going to come, he's going to take you into captivity. This is the beginning of all of this. And so as we come, it's the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, it's the tenth month, and in that ninth year and tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar comes from Babylon down to Ju- Judah, down to Jerusalem, and he begins this, this, uh, to besiege them. The idea of besieging them just simply means that they would, uh, they would set up um, a perimeter around the city and they would allow nothing to come out and they'd allow nothing to go in. And eventually, if they were patient enough, the city would eventually collapse. It would crumble and they would give in. They would either starve to death or they would surrender. And then they, so, so basically the tactic, this warfare tactic, was basically just patience. And so Nebuchadnezzar just waited. Two years later, it's now the 11th year and fourth month of Zedekiah's reign, the city of Jerusalem falls. And that's the second fast that had been observed. And so the first fast they would observe every 10th month of every year. The second fast, and really if if we go in proper order, it would have been the fourth month of every year. They would fast and they would remember, they would commemorate this tragic event of the city of Jerusalem, their capital city falling. The third fast was the commemoration of the burning of the temple in the fifth month. So the the tenth month of year nine of Zedekiah's reign, this besiegement begins. The fourth month of year 11, so a little less than two years, the city of Jerusalem falls, and Nebuchadnezzar and his troops storm the city of Jerusalem, and they overtake things. 
A month later, after this, this invasion, when Babylon now has control of the city of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar says, burn the temple down. This is Solomon's temple, by the way. This is the height of their pride. This is, you know, it'd be like somebody taking a, our Capitol building in Washington, D.C., or the White House and destroying it, doing something like that. I mean, no doubt it broke their hearts to see their temple in flames. And so every fifth month, they would commemorate that with a fast and with weeping. There was one final fast that they commemorated. This was the murder of a man by the name of Gedaliah, who was the governor, and this took place in the seventh month. So out of 12 months of the year, four months are given to sorrow, to sighing, to pain, to crying, to looking back and remembering these tragic events. Four of those months are given to these specific fasts. So these delegates, they come from Babylon, and they're led by Sherezer and Regamelech, and they had come to inquire as to whether, is it still necessary for us to do this? Do we really need to keep doing this over and over and over again? I mean, do we really have to take the fourth month and the fifth month and the seventh month and the tenth month? And do we really have to mourn and weep and sorrow? And do we really have to fast during, during this time? Is this something we need to continue? Well, I mean, they looked around. They saw the walls been rebuilt. The temple is being rebuilt. And so in their minds, they think, well, we don't have to do this anymore but we don't want to stop doing it if we're supposed to still be doing it. And so you guys go, you find out, you check into this, you look into this for us. Now, let me stop here for just a moment. And, and before we move on, let me just say, be careful about dwelling too much on the negative things that life has thrown your way. I mean, I don't know what you've had to deal with in life. I don't necessarily find this to be a real healthy practice. I mean, four months out of a 12-month year, we find them fasting, mourning, perhaps donning sackcloth and ashes, looking back at, at, at these tragic events. I'm, I'm not opposed to looking back and remembering our history. I think we do that on September the 11th and, and uh, December 7th, and there's just some different dates throughout the year in which you know, some Americans made some incredible sacrifices. But, I mean, we don't spend, we don't spend a whole month doing it. Uh, we, we, we look back so that perhaps we can remember so that we maybe don't ever fall back into that same trap. But, but I, I think that there's a, a clear message here that we need to be careful. It's not wise to consistently walk around for days in mourning over something that has happened in your past. Well, look, if you've recently buried a loved one, then I, then I, think that, you know, I think all of us would understand that. If you've recently gone through some uh, terrible trial, th then I think that there is a, there's a proper period for mourning. But I also think that there's a time in which you say, I'll never get over this particular thing that took place in my life. I understand that. But I think there's also a, a time where we pick ourselves back up and where we wipe the tears away and we say, look, I've got a life to live. I've got a mission to accomplish I've got a family that needs ministered to, and I've got a church that, uh, that, that has a role for me to play, and I cannot sit around all day wallowing in self-pity. I cannot spend the rest of my life like this. And so, listen, again, in life, sorrow and heartache are very real. I get that. I understand that. But be careful not to allow that to define you. I, I've, often, I've often thought about the character, and forgive me for using for using a, a, a child's story, but I've often thought about the character Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh. Uh, you, you know who I'm talking about, right? I think he's a donkey. He's got a little thing tied to his tail, and he just has the, the saddest, most forlorn look on his face. And if you can't pick up on it from his expression, you can pick up on it from his voice. It's just a woe is me. My life is awful. Even on the most beautiful of days, I'm going to find something to complain about. You understand, listen, that, that attitude is not befitting of a Christian. That's not befitting of someone who has been bought by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. That, that's not befitting of someone uh, who, who, listen, is seated in the heavenlies. My place is reserved. My, my home is there. And, and again, I don't know what kind of bad news you've had to deal with. And I don't know what kind of cloud is hanging over you at this point in time. But I'm just, simply, I'm just simply trying to tell you that, listen, there is enough reason for you to pick your head up and smile a little bit and rejoice a little bit because God has been awful good to all of us. So I would caution us about this activity. We find 
For 70 years, the Jews have marked every Every year, four of these months, and they've given them over to these fasts. And they've sat around, woe is me, for a whole month. Remember when Jerusalem fell? Remember when Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged us? Remember when they burned the temple? Remember when the governor get a lie? Remember when he was murdered? Oh, my soul, woe is us. Look at all the problems we've had to deal with. So the question is, do we have to keep doing this? That's verse 3. God gives an answer in the rest of this chapter. And here's God's answer, plain and simple. It's this. God says, I never commanded you to do those things. I never told you to do that. You you made this up on your own. This was your idea. This was not my idea. So as far as I'm concerned, you can keep doing it if you want to. But I've never commanded you to do this. I never expected you to do this. This was never my plan for you as a people. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? For 70 years, they religiously had kept these fasts, but God never one time told them to do so. God never said, now look, I want you to mark. I want you to mark this event. I want you to be sad every, every year on this particular month. I want you to mourn, and I want you to have sorrow over this event. God never, you'll look, you search throughout your Bible, you'll never find it. If only, listen, I, I, almost, I almost think God's sat, sitting in heaven. I almost think he's saying, If only you would have been as faithful to keep my commandments that I did give you as you were to keep some weird religious ritual that you invented yourself. Now let that sink in for just a minute. See, here's why these fasts were wrong. They were wrong on on, on at least three levels. Number one, God says this, they were not done to the glory of God. Look in verse number five. God is speaking according to verse number four, and he says this, speak unto all the people of the land and to the priest, saying, when ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? So God is saying, this had nothing to do with me. This wasn't about me at all. This was about your pity. This was about your sorrow. This was about your misery. This had nothing to do with me. So number one, this fast was wrong because it had nothing to do with glorifying God. Number two, these fasts were wrong because these fasts had just become simply a giant pity party for the Jews. When, as, as they walked around for these months, their heads hung. They weren't eating properly. They weren't, they weren't getting the proper amount of beverages in their body. And uh, perhaps maybe their faces were sunken and hollow. And perhaps their clothing was, was ratter, uh, tattered and torn. And, and, and maybe they had donned themselves in some sackcloth. And, and, and so they walked around and they were just kind of this show. And people, foreigners, would walk up to them and they would say, what's wrong? What's wrong? Oh, the fifth month in my homeland, Nebuchadnezzar, he burned my temple. My house of worship. Can you imagine someone being so cruel, being so heartless? Don't you feel sorry for me? I mean, literally, that's that's what this had become. It was nothing but a giant pity party for them to wallow in their sorrow four months out of 12 months of every year. It it was, it was, um, it it, it, it turned into that. And, And then I think the third reason why these fasts were wrong is because they had missed the point completely. Look in verse number seven. God says this. He says, should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her when, when men inhabited the south and the plain? Here, here's what God, God is saying. Guys, you missed it. You missed it completely. He's saying this. He's saying, if you would have just obeyed me then, there would have been no besieging by Nebuchadnezzar. There would have been no city falling. There would have been no burning of Solomon's temple. Because if you go back far enough in your history, Jerusalem was a happening place. Money was flowing in. People were prosperous and the city was filled and the surrounding areas were filled and and, and, and life was good there. And, and, And yet, 
And yet, during those times when I sent the former prophets, you refused to hearken, you refused to listen. And so really, the, the besieging of Jerusalem and the falling of the city and the burned temple and the death of Gedaliah, it's your fault. And you, you want to walk around and you want to cause everyone to feel sorry for you and to have a pity party for you. But if you would have just gone back and if you would have been just, just listen when I told you, if you would have, have heeded my warnings, you'd have never had to deal with any of this in the first place. And they had missed it completely. In the midst of all of this, I believe God tells his people living in Babylon that due to several factors, he will not hear them when they cry unto him. And I want to ask this question, is it possible that God still deals with us in a similar way tonight? Is it possible that as we look at these three things, and we'll be done, I don't have a lot of time to spend here, but is it possible that God would still turn a deaf ear to us tonight if he finds these same things in our lives. There's three things here that I believe provoke or elicit the silent treatment from God. Number one, we can expect God to be silent when we elevate man above God. We can expect God to be silent when we elevate our opinion, our philosophies, our ideas, when we elevate those things above the very word of God, you can expect that God is not going to hear you. Amen. Seventy years, they fasted. They did all of these things. And God's attitude is, oh, if you would have just been as faithful to my word as you were to the things you made up 70 years ago. If you would have been as faithful to follow me and to follow my law as you were to follow your own law, as you were to follow something that I never commanded you to do in the first place, imagine how much better off you would be. You know, I'm afraid sometimes we as Christians, we, we make up stuff about the Christian life. We invent stuff that just isn't there. And we convince ourselves, oh, it's there. Daddy told me it was there. Granddaddy told me it was there. The preacher told me it was there. Listen, if it's not there, it's not there. Follow God. Follow his word. Elevate his word above some man-made philosophy or idea. Follow God in all things. Be careful not to elevate man above God. Number two, we can expect God to be silent when we eradicate righteousness out of our lives. In verses 8 to 11, God's message to them was this. For forget about these silly fasts and start doing what I've longed for you to do all along. I believe that this is the idea of, I believe that this is the idea of, of, of practical righteousness. And he lists these things here for us. Did you notice verse number nine? He says this, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, execute true judgment. Instead of, instead of inventing all these new things, instead of all these fasts that you've religiously held to, why don't you try this? Why don't you just try executing true judgment? You say, well, what exactly does that mean? That simply means determine what is right and what is wrong and follow it regardless of relationship, regardless of politics or any such thing. In other words, what is right is right no matter who does it or who doesn't do it. And what is wrong is always wrong no matter who does it or who doesn't do it. Here's what we do sometimes. We, we, we say, well, you know, that, that's terrible behavior, and we would never excuse that in the, in the life of an enemy. But when a friend does it, we're like, well, maybe it's not so bad. If it's an enemy, we, 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 we eviscerate them. I would never, I would never be caught doing something such as that, but when it's a friend, that's eh, okay. God says that's not practical righteousness. Execute true judgment no matter who does it. When you find yourself not executing true judgment, get back on track. Don't excuse it in your own life either. What is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. Number two, what's practical righteousness? God wanted his people to show mercy and compassion to their brother. Look, it says execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion to every man to his brother. Have concern for one another. Not merely a refusal to do wrong to our brother, but also a willingness to do whatever is in our power to help him. Number three, what is practical righteousness? God wanted his people to not oppress the weak. You know what this means? It just simply means don't take advantage of those who are easily taken advantage of. Verse number 10. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, 
nor the poor. God says, hey, hey guys, why don't, you, why don't you try something different? Instead of fasting for four months out of the year, why don't you try this? Why don't you start executing true judgment? Why don't you start showing compassion and mercy towards your brother? Why don't you stop taking advantage of those who are weak and those who are oppressed? And then the fourth thing he says this, he says, he says lastly in verse number 10, and, and, and uh, let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. I just wonder if maybe God says four fasts, four replacements for those fasts. So maybe in the fourth month, you, can, you guys can work on this. Maybe in the fifth month, you can try this. Maybe in month seven, pull this out of your hat. Maybe in month 10, why don't you start focusing on this? Four errors, four things that they had elevated above God. In four ways, God says, why don't you get back to just fleshing out practical righteousness? Can I tell you that when we eradicate righteousness out of our lives, when we, when we do away with righteousness in our individual lives, you can expect that the ceiling will be brass. You can expect that the God of heaven will not hear you. Lastly, and I'll be done, we can expect God to be silent when we eliminate his voice from our lives. Notice verse number 11. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Do you see how childish this is? They, they did one of these numbers. I'm not listening. They literally, they plugged their ears so that they would not hear the voice of God. You mark it down. If you take this attitude in your life, God says, well, that's fine. If you're not going to listen to me, don't expect me to listen to you. God's final verdict is found in Zechariah 7.13. We read it in the beginning. We'll finish here. Therefore, it has come to pass that as he, the former prophets, as they cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Have you been getting the silent treatment from God in your life? Perhaps it's because you've gone astray in one of these particular areas. Maybe you've eliminated hearing his voice. Maybe you quit going to church. Or maybe you're here, but you're not really here. It's one ear in one ear and out the other. Maybe you've slowly eradicated practical righteousness out of your life. You're no longer executing true judgment. You're no longer showing love and compassion and mercy towards your brother. You're no longer, you're no longer not taking advantage of the press, but you're looking for ways that you can take advantage and you're imagining and you're thinking evil in your heart towards your brother. And as a result of that, you have completely eradicated practical righteousness out of your life. Listen, I'm telling you, if that's the way you're living, God will not hear you. The Bible says this in Psalm 68, 13. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Perhaps maybe you have elevated some man's philosophy or opinion, or maybe even your own philosophy and opinion. You've elevated above this book. And as a result, God has said, I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to listen. Perhaps, perhaps you have, have begun to get the silent treatment from God. Listen, there is hope. Repentance. All you have to do is you come, listen, come to him and open your ears again. Start listening. Start obeying. Start hearkening. God will once again open up his ears to you. God will hear you. And God will answer your prayers. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed.